Hi, Rob D here with Rob B. We're here from Property Hub to solve a problem for you. Yes, getting the money for deposits to invest in property can be challenging. Finding a way to do it is pretty hard. Well, we haven't got one way for you to do it. We've got six. Hopefully this won't come as a big revelation to you, but whichever strategy you've chosen, however you want to invest, you'll need some money to do it. Yes, you'll need some cash to build your property portfolio. Now, way back in the past, before the last property crash, there were some no money down strategies. So you could get into property without putting any of your own cash in. But after the crash, the rules were tightened up and now they don't exist. You'll still come across people who try and tell you that you can invest in property without using any money. And while it's possible that they've discovered some magical secret that no one else is aware of, it's far more likely that they're just trying to sell you something. So beware. Don't get sucked into believing that you don't need to use your own money and instead start thinking about how you're going to use your own money or where your money for investment is going to come from. The good news is that you don't need to use all your own money. You can use a mortgage for the majority of most property purchases. As a general guideline, you can use mortgages for up to 75% of the purchase price. Sometimes it's a bit less, sometimes it's a bit more, but 75% is a good general number to have in mind. So assuming that you do use a mortgage, you're going to need to have your own cash to cover the remaining 25% or so, plus any costs that you encounter in the process. So let's run through the six main sources of funding that most investors use to get their portfolio started. Number one, saving. Yep, boring, but it works. You may have saved for a holiday before, a car, well buy to let investors will often save for a deposit because they know the benefits that it will bring them. Now, saving for your first one or two properties can be a long process depending on your disposable income. But the good news is it does get easier as your portfolio grows because you'll have more properties bringing in more income. So your savings pot tops up a lot faster. So it's gonna require patience in the beginning, but eventually as your portfolio gets to a decent size, things begin to snowball for the better. So saving doesn't get talked about much because it's not exciting, but it is the most common method of getting cash together to buy investment property with. The second most common method is releasing equity from your own home. Many people are in the situation where they don't have that much in the way of savings, or maybe they're not able to save up that much extra every month, but they are in a position where they own a home, where they've been paying down the mortgage, where the value of that property has gone up over a number of years, and now they're in a position where they've got equity in their home that they can release to turn into cash and use that cash to buy property with. So compared to saving, equity release is a form of borrowing, but the good news is it's the cheapest borrowing you'll ever have. Because lenders feel very secure with residential property, the rates are among the lowest you're ever going to get, and you can take that mortgage out over a long period of time. So for many people, it's an attractive option. However, it's not something that everyone's gonna be comfortable with. If everything goes horribly wrong, you are putting your home at risk. Some people will be comfortable with that because they'll believe that the risk is low because they're not pursuing a particularly risky property investment strategy, but for other people, it just won't be acceptable. There are also investors who just don't want to have debt against their main home. They wanna get their mortgage paid down to nothing as quickly as they can, and that's fine. There's no right or wrong answer. It's all about what you're comfortable with and what makes sense for your situation. But if you do have equity in your home, it is an option that you can consider. Your next potential option could be family money. You may be fortunate enough that you have a relative, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, who have a bit more cash than you, and even more importantly, are willing to give it to you so you can start your property investment journey. They may do it and be happy to split the profits with you, or if you're very lucky, they might just give you the money because they're being nice. Be kind enough to make sure that your strategy is the right one and those funds don't get wasted. The next option is rather than using family money, use other people's money, either friends or acquaintances. These are generally known as joint ventures. So this could be you and a friend each pooling a smaller amount of money. So when you combine them, you've got enough. Or it could be a different kind of split where your friend or acquaintance is putting in all the money and you are putting in the time or the knowledge. Joint ventures can work really well, but you've got to be exceptionally careful. If you're joining forces for a short-term project like a flip, there's a lot that can go wrong and you can end up losing money rather than making it quite easy. And if it's a longer-term project, like you're going in on buying a long-term buy-to-let together, then you're going to have a joint investment for quite a long period of time and you're going to have to agree on how to handle everything that comes up and trust that your interests are going to remain aligned. These kinds of things can really stretch a friendship if it's a friend that you're working with. 
And if it's not a friend you're working with, it's someone who you don't know so well, well, that's risky in a very different way because who knows what they're gonna be like to work with. So while joint ventures can work, I believe that they're best reserved for when you're further on in your property journey and you're confident about what you're doing. You've got a strategy that works and you just want some extra cash so you can repeat it more and faster. When you're starting in property, there's a lot that you don't know. There's a lot of mistakes that you're gonna make. Do you really want to be making those mistakes with a friend's money? I'd suggest that you probably don't. Next on the list is credit cards. Now you can't officially put your deposit on a credit card, but what you can do is use it to fund your refurb costs. And this can work quite well if the card has a long interest-free period and you just make the minimum payments. So you would buy the property, add value to it via the credit card, and then get it refinanced, hopefully at a higher value at a later date once the work is done, and then pay off the credit card. Now, if this sounds a bit risky, it's because it is. You should be very wary about implementing this strategy if you've not done property investment before. But if you've built up confidence and experience by doing a few refurbs and you've run out of cash and you want to carry on, well then, credit cards could be an option for you. The final source of funding that we're going to talk about is bridging finance. Bridging finance is borrowing money from a bank or another financial institution like you would with a mortgage. But unlike a mortgage, which will last for 20 plus years, bridging finance is short term. It's designed to be paid back normally within a year. Now, it's technically possible to take out bridging finance that will cover 100% of the property purchase and your costs, but it's unusual. What you can normally do, though, depending on the project and how you structure it, is borrow more on bridging finance than you would be able to with a normal mortgage. So you're not eliminating the requirement to put in your own money, but you are potentially needing to put in less than you would with a mortgage. So you're not relying as much on your own savings or any of the other methods we've talked about. Now, much like credit cards, bridging finance is not for beginners. It is risky and it's risky because it needs to be paid back quickly. And the only ways you can pay it back are by either completing the project and selling it or by refinancing, by replacing the bridging finance with a long-term mortgage. And there are any number of reasons why you might not be able to do that in the relatively short amount of time you've got. And if you get stuck on bridging finance, the rates are high and it can get very, very expensive. So again, bridging finance can be a fantastic tool that you can use to accelerate the growth of your portfolio, but it's probably not something you should be using on your first couple of deals. So there you go, six different ways to raise funds for finance. But a big part of finance are mortgages, and you really need to understand how mortgages work. Definitely, and luckily we've got a video to help you out with exactly that. So make sure you watch that one next, and subscribe to the channel for more like this.